Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Elena Chia, and we also have Jim Vanderwall here from the Fraser Basin Council. We'll be getting started shortly. We're just going to wait a few minutes for more people to sign in. And as we wait, I'd just like to launch a poll to get a sense of who is listening today. So if you could take a, a few moments to fill out this poll. All right, so thank you very much for participating. It looks like we have um, a fair representation from local governments or First Nations, and as well as the provincial and federal government and business and consultant, and also a few people from um, academia and the non-government sector. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for our webinar on planning for a resilient waterfront at Qualicum Beach. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Elena Chia, and we also have Jim Vanderwall here from the Fraser Basin Council. And this webinar is the third of a series that we're doing on local governments preparing for sea level rise. And this webinar series is part of our BC Regional Adaptation Collaborative Program, um, or BC RAC. And what we are doing through BC RAC is supporting local governments, First Nations, and industries in integrating climate adaptation into their planning and decision making. Um, as part of BC RAC, we have the retooling website, uh, retooling.ca, where you can find tools and resources for climate adaptation, such as case studies, plans, climate research, videos, and more. Um, we'd like to thank our funders for this program, which includes Natural Resource Canada's Adaptation Platform Program, as well as the BC Ministry of Environment. Uh, so some webinar logistics we want to cover for today. Um, we ask that you keep your audio muted to limit any background feedback. Um, 
If you have questions, you'll see that on the panel on the side, there is a question box. Um, you can type in your questions there throughout the presentation. Uh, however, we're going to hold off our Q&A until after the presentations. Um, if you encounter any technical difficulties through our webinar, you can also type um, speak to us through the question box, uh, or you can send an email to FraserBasin at gmail.com. Uh, so today we're really fortunate to have two great speakers, uh, Luke Sales, who is the Director of Planning at the Town of Qualicum Beach, as well as, well as John Reedshaw, who is from SNC Lavalin, and he um, is a manager there in coastal um, management and water interface engineering. And they will be speaking about the town of Qualicum Beach's process of creating a waterfront master plan. And this plan is in response to the town's increasingly intense storm effects, um, such as foreshore ecosystem degradation, wave overtopping, uh, damage to the seawall, as well as beach loss. So we're really excited to have them here today to speak about this plan. And right now, I'm going to switch over our uh, presentation to them. Just a, one moment here. Sorry, Luke, just give us a moment. We're having a few difficulties that you could tell with the audio, so just bear with us for a minute. Hey, Luke, you're talking, but we can't hear you. Just hold on a sec. Sorry, everyone. Oh, this audio is disconnecting now. To you this morning. I'm, I'm here to present on our waterfront master plan, which is a very exciting project here in Quality. Just to set the context, for those of you who are not familiar with, with our town, Qualicum Beach is located on the east side of Vancouver Island um, with some fairly lengthy, lengthy exposures to the northwest and, and southeast. So uh, everyone in the town knows very clearly that we do experience heavy storms periodically. And so it's it's at everyone's the forefront of their awareness. Several years ago, when we began our 2011 official community plan review, residents and stakeholder groups proposed a number of very innovative concepts for our waterfront. That's maybe proposals for re revitalizing the waterfront, but at that time, simply didn't have the appropriate groundwork established. To to determine whether those ideas were feasible. We knew knew we should be planning for sea level rise over the next approximately 100 years, but we didn't know exactly how that would impact Qualicum Beach specifically. So 
we propose the two. First, we would typical analysis, and then we would undertake a planning process to evaluate some of the concepts that had been previously proposed. So here this morning, I'm, we're going to be hearing from John Lynn, who was the consultant organization that we hired to do the first phase of the project. So just in, in overall terms, this, this is the challenge. If this is normal, obviously not a daily occurrence, but this has happened and, and does happen on the Qualicum Beach waterfront. If this is normal, what does one meter of sea level rise look like? I'll hand it over to John Reed, John. No, thank you, Luke. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody if you're in different time zones. Um, so I'm the manager of the Coastal Engineering Group at SNC Lavalin here in Vancouver, and there's five or six people in our group. And this presentation really represents the efforts of a lot of those people plus other individuals within our company organization. So what we're going to go over is the overall approach of the work we've done, the little bit of description of the physical setting of Qualicum Beach for those not familiar, and bring up some important points, and then we'll briefly go over the physical wind and wave, med ocean processes, then the coastal sediment transport and processes, a little bit of discussion on the validation of the results that we got and the uh, setting. So this is the physical setting um, of Qualicum Beach looking from offshore. You can see a dark uh, line, which you've identified there as the coastal plain. That's a low-lying area. It rises up to the mountains in the background. Uh, Mount Arrowsmith, uh, a key part of the town uh, background. So if you take a um, cross-section through that picture, it's a little bit artistic here, some license. There's Mount Arrowsmith with the peaks at the top, the coastal plain kind of margin identified, and the geodetic datum for today. And this, we're just going to go through a couple of slides here fairly quickly um, to uh, bring some history in. So about 14,000 years ago, glaciers extended right to the top of Mount Arrowsmith. It's about 1,800 meters. That suppressed the coastal plain, the whole east coast of Vancouver Island, about 150 meters below the present datum today. And at the same time, sea level was about 120 meters lower. Now, over 8,000 years, um, the ice melted. There was ice static rebound. Vancouver Island, about 21 millimeters per year, and as the water flowed off the melting ice, it moved sediments off along that coastal plain, which was slowly emerging, uh, and down to the shoreline, and, and that was about 20 meters below where it is today. So after 6,000 years, and since then, uh, the isostatic rebound has stopped, and uh, but sea levels continued to rise, and the average rate uh, from 6,000 years ago. We go to about 1900, is about 0.6 millimeters per year. Uh, and at the same time, uh, rebound of the islands, the uh, tonic plates collisions off the uh, the Cascadia subduction zone offshore of the west coast of the island has been pushing the island up at about two to three mil the, the east coast of the island up about two to three millimeters per year. Uh, sea level has been rising, and there's been a net lifting up of the seabed in the coastal zone. That's that blue margin there about 1.9 millimeters a year. And in the Qualicum Beach area, that actually translates to a supply of material of about 12,500 12, cubic meters per year. Now, uh, since that time uh, to the present, sea level rise has, has increased. It's gone from about 0.6 to 3.3 millimeters per year. If we just talk the global averages, tectonic uplift is still going on. So the island is still um, emerging slow it's it's been slowly actually reducing its emergence and and today it's basically in balance 3.3 millimeters to versus 3.0 no, the 3 millimeters of tectonic uplift so we're not supplying that 12,500 cubic meters of sediment anymore and if we look forward to the future well um, at present it seems when you go to the uh, latest data sources that actually sea level rises are pushing in the last five years about 12 mil millimeters per year of rise, maybe a little bit different here in British Columbia. And there are some folks, uh, Jim Hansen's paper, which some might be aware of, are saying maybe 50 millimeters. We've also got uh, four rivers and creeks in the area that have, uh, have the potential to, to deposit sediment into the coastal zone, the French Creek, Little Qualicum River, the two big ones in east and west of the town and Beach Creek and Grandin Creek um, are smaller creeks. And they're contributing a similar amount of material. 
Uh, if we go back to 1908, when this all started, this is a view of the Qualicum Beach area before any development. They're just cutting the trees uh, on the golf course, which is a key part of the town today. And you can see offshore, if you look very carefully, it's an old photograph, that there's an extensive fine sand beach, then there's a black line that runs all the way around the bay. That's a line of beach rack, seaweed, so to speak. And then there's an upper tidal uh, beach um, above that. As the town sort of built out and developed, there's various commercial properties got established. This is the far at before. You see some camps, Grandview Camp, a restaurant, Shady Rest, which is actually still here. This photo is from about 1930, and you can see that the development was pretty close to the beach line, high tide line. There's a bit of a road now leading to these developments, and you can still see that fine sandy beach uh, out at low tide with people on it. That has slowly evolved uh, over time, and we don't, uh, we'll have to skip over a few things. There's a lot of reports on the town's website that describe a lot more detail than we can go into, so I'm sure we'll find a way to get that link to you. But if we go back to the view from offshore, at the left-hand side of the ellipse there, we're looking at the Eagle Crest area today. You can see an upper intertidal beach prism. It's fairly coarse cobble, and then there's a low tide, fairly narrow sandbar. At the same time, if you go to the town waterfront, you can see on the right-hand side a seawall, an upper tidal beach, and a much more extensive bar. Um, so what we're going to go over briefly right now is some brief uh, background to the coastal process modeling. We had to build various components for the suite of models we used, a tidal model for a large part of the strait to get the currents, a wind and wave model that covered all of the strait uh, right down to the far end, past Vancouver. And then this coastal modeling component, the CMS component from a model system from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, engineers which is just looking at that small section there by Qualicum Beach. The tide models uh, basically uh, showed us that in front of the town waterfront, which is uh, right in the middle of these two images, is basically an area of still water. That's what the white contours offshore are showing. Whereas on either side, depending on whether it's a flood or an ebb, there's much stronger currents. And that's about half a meter per second or close to a knot of current on maximum flood or maximum ebb. The uh, spring tides, which are shown here, are a little bit higher than the neap tides, but there's really not much difference. And uh, we'll talk about the sea level rise later. The wind and wave models um, that we compiled, we looked, in the end, we produced uh, 20 years of. Um, hourly wave data and what we've done here is just isolated the severe storms from the southeast uh, coming up the strait from the Vancouver area. These blue dots are all the storms in that period that were gale force or higher and for those of you who are familiar with the coast it wouldn't be surprising if BC ferries cancelled sailings or delayed sailings in these events. They're fairly severe events. At the same time in the lower line the red dots are the northwesterly storms that are mainly associated with outflow conditions, Arctic outflow conditions. Sometimes it's the result of a large ridge of high pressure offshore so they have different components and you can see that there are interesting groups of storms. We won't go into that in great detail but we will allude to them a little bit later. There's this for instance in uh, the last four years there's been um, basically no northwesterly Wave models, one of the events that one of those blue dots is shown here, uh, you can see that the, the seas uh, in the strait vary considerably and in this case right in the middle on the left hand side is Qualicum Beach and uh, it's fairly severe in that particular storm. And if we zoom in you can see close to the shoreline, uh, first of all the high waves offshore, uh, you see a feature just to the right-hand side where the waves are kind of concentrating. That's a subtitle feature, which is really important. We'll show that in a minute. Uh, and in the area of the town, uh, there's much lower waves. Now, the first contour line offshore of the um, the um, air photo of the, the, the town is actually the zero tide contour. So that whole intertidal area is within that contour line. This is a northwesterly storm, and again, uh, Qualicum Beach is up there by that or the orange area. So the strong winds are focusing wave energy in the Qualicum Beach area. And if we look at the uh, shoreline area along the town's waterfront itself, you can see that uh, the color scales are exactly the same. So the waves offshore are a little bit smaller, um, but close to the town, close to the seawall, they're quite a bit higher. They're almost twice the height. And the east end of town, the right-hand side, 
you see the orange offshore, that's an area where the jet effect and the winds are creating more severe conditions. So that end of the Qualicum Beach area is much more exposed. So we're going to go fairly quickly here to the results of the coastal modeling model of the system. This is the usual conditions in a northwesterly in the absence of any sea walls and the yellow and blue just showing areas of erosion and deposition. Slight deposition on the intertidal beach, a bit of erosion right at the edge. We go to more severe and a ridge of high pressure can build up. You can see that Well, in three areas along the coast where you can see a patch of severe um, erosion and then right beside it deposition. Uh, if you go about over to the right hand side, you can see two areas of there. If we look at the southeast storms, those distinct areas um, that are still there, their directions, their erosion deposition patterns reverse. Um, but if you go to the town waterfront, you can still see an air, a pattern of erosion by the uh, zero tide contour and some deposition up on the high tide beach. Um, mentioned all those groups of storms. We looked at those. We'll direct you to the reports to see more of the information. But basically, if you get a long series of storms, this is one episode when there were basically 15 southeast storms, no northwesterly storms. And the patterns are the same. They're just much stronger and more extreme. Now. We did have some audio or some video of sediments moving along the upper intertidal in a storm um, on the, that's the upper intertidal and also on the uh, subtidal. However, we've not been able to get this technology to allow us to play those. So we'll find a way to uh, make those available. And they show how the sediments move along the shoreline and out of the areas where these patches of sediment um, are indicated. Um, I think we'll just move on to the interests of time here. This is an awful lot of material. There's about 350 pages in the report, so I uh, appreciate everybody's patience and indulgence here. So if we look at the large main Qualicum Beach shoreline area from one end to the other, back in 1930, uh, prior to 1930 when it was basically undeveloped, you can see that in a southeasterly storm, we were losing, the area was losing about 18,000 cubic meters of sediment due to wave and current action. However, that's quite a bit less than, uh, oh, we got this going faster than we can speak. <laughs> um, so historically, the area was, was eroding about 18,000 cubic meters a year. Uh, however, matching volumes of sediment were being supplied by the rising seabed and, and by the river and creek sediments. So it was added up to about 25,000 cubic meters approximately. So the area was in a bit of a dynamic equilibrium. Um, there was some very slow but nearly imperceptible erosion that occurred during storms, often restored when a different storm came. Um, but the area was slowly built out with seawalls. Now, we've looked, spent quite a lot of time looking at the effect of those seawalls. This is just an image showing the distribution of seawalls and their types along the shoreline. I'm going to move along here. Um, and we ended up looking at three scenarios here as the shoreline evolved, the undeveloped shoreline. You, we talked about that. The developing shoreline, which is reflecting the fine sand still being present on the beaches and the construction of the seawalls, and then the existing shoreline today where that high tide prism is mainly coarse gravel. And you can see that in a southeasterly storm, if we just concentrate on the town waterfront in an adjacent area, which is called Judges Row, then on the full profile, uh, there wasn't much change at first, but uh, today there's a lot less deposition in southeasterly storms in the town waterfront area where the waves are smaller, as we showed in southeasterly winds. And if we look at the intertidal portion, you can see that initially when the seawalls were built, the rate of erosion, this is millimeters of change in beach elevation in a particular storm, that just about doubled. Uh, and today, as now there's coarse gravel just on the upper intertidal, mainly because of the reflections from the coarse gravel itself, we're actually losing uh, almost twice as much again. During northwesterly storms, the changes weren't quite as big. Um, in fact, it's gone up 
a little bit. The erosion has actually increased a little bit. Uh, and again, if you go look at the intertidal, uh, see that overall across the profile, the changes aren't very much. But if we go to the upper intertidal, you can see that as the seawalls got built, we went from 1.8 millimeters of loss to 4 millimeters of loss, almost a doubling. And then actually, as the beaches evolved into coarse gravel beach, that's gone up. Uh, we're now actually trapping sand, and that sand is coming. That's fine sand being trapped in the gravel, coming from the losses out on the lower intertidal. You can see that uh, 42.6 millimeters of loss that's being experienced now on the lower intertidal. So the, the seawalls had quite a significant effect, and um, we spent quite a bit of time in this assignment here for the town looking at the historical information um, to see if the what's actually been experienced is consistent and with the model and vice versa. This is an image, one end of the town from 1950. We've gone to a lot of work to make sure we're in about the same position of, as the photographer. And I think uh, if you look carefully at the end of the upper intertidal beach, you can kind of see a hollowing out, um, which I, we believe is now a combination of the loss of the fine sand out of the upper intertidal and the lower intertidal. Here's another view of that shady rest you can see these young girls building a sandcastle. Uh, we won't go into the scaling, but we've gone to great care to make sure we're again in the right position. And if you go down to the lower view, uh, you see a red line there, which was the old, which was the transition to the fine sand bar in 1930, its location. That transmission has moved well inshore, again, sort of showing the combination of loss of the upper intertidal and the lower intertidal beach. Here's another view just further along the beach, and I think you can see here the same hollowing out of that interface uh, between the um, upper intertidal and the lower intertidal portions of the profile. Again, very consistent with the expected presence of the seawalls. So having said that, we then took this model, having satisfied ourselves that it reproduced the past and added a meter of sea level rise to it. You can see the, the uh, results for the um, uh, existing conditions and the historical conditions on the left-hand side of this table. And then we simulated a number of different shoreline scenarios. We'll talk about that uh, in a minute here. And what you see, if you look at the top line for a southeast storm on the full profile, is that the net erosion has basically been decreasing. And that was a bit of a surprise. If we go specifically to the town waterfront area, um, it's a little bit different there. Look at the full profile in the southeast storm. Uh, there's basically no change, but if you look at the intertidal portion, and here options, you can see the three options that we're looking at. One is essentially no change. People leave all their seawalls the same. Option two is they raise them, and option three is they basically replace them with a beach. You can see in the upper intertidal in the southeast storm, we actually start trapping more fine sand. And if we go back and look at the, we'd go down and look at the northwesterly storms, we actually get quite a bit less erosion in a northwesterly storm with a beach concept out there. And if you go down to the upper intertidal area, then we actually have uh, quite a lot more fine sand. And most of that fine sand is coming from the lower intertidal, where you can see that the erosion has gone from 42 millimeters to 46 millimeters on the low tide sand. So there's an interesting interplay between the upper inter intertidal beaches. But the intertidal beach will slowly be flooded and less available and the upper intertidal with a beach concept would slowly gain fine sand and keep the beach asset, the, the, which is the big amenity of Qualicum Beach area. Um, so you know, at high level, then the climate change implications to this bit of coastline is with the meter of sea level rise, the rates of erosion across the intertidal profile are going to slow down. And this was a surprise to us, quite a big surprise. It actually involved a lot of work to check and double check what the models were telling us. And the rates were not significantly affected by the type of coastal structures that people might uh, leave, modify, replace um, in, in the area, except in the upper intertidal, which is also a surprise. And that's because, essentially, the increased depth of water uh, in the intertidal results less energy dissipation and, therefore, substantially more wave energy arriving right at the shoreline. So that was a big surprise. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means in the future. Um, this plot here actually shows the last four years of the wave climate, the hourly wave climate. It shows the energy right at the shoreline in the present for the 
coralline and future. Um, if you look here, this is about uh, 1.6 million joules of energy per meter of shoreline arriving every hour. Um, we'll let you go look up what joules is, but it's uh, you know, that's a lot of wave energy. It's a lot less, though, than what we show there offshore, which is in deep water. And as uh, your sea level rises, I think you can see from the blue and red dots on the right-hand side, considerably more episodes of, of energy arriving. And actually, if you look very carefully at those two lines, uh, there's about 10 times as much energy arriving at the shoreline. This is in the Eagle Crest area, uh, where the wave energy, the waves, the shoreline is more exposed. Uh, sorry, if we just back up a little bit here, that's the town waterfront. And I think if we flick back in here, you can just see how those dots are moving around. So it's a little bit of difference from area to area. But I think you get a sense that in the future, there's going to be a lot more wave energy arriving a lot more frequently. Now, this is a picture taken by a resident during a storm. We specifically looked at this. That's this one. That's 1 1.6 million joules per meter per hour arriving on the shoreline. So what this is telling us is these sort of conditions are going to happen a lot more frequently, a lot more often, and almost 10 times as much. So there's implications here to the land use planning for the town of Qualicum Beach. And we're going to just go through that a little bit. This is a table that shows various conditions that can occur at the shoreline, from minor overtopping all the way down to extensive flooding, it being dangerous to drive, or you'd expect damage. And there's some thresholds which are shown in red. It's just leaders per meter per second of waves of water coming over the shoreline edge, whatever that treatment is. Uh, and what those mean, if we look at the low thresholds, the 0 0.01, for instance, is the storm in the city of Victoria and Vancouver uh, last year. Um, and on the left-hand side, that's about 0 0.01 liters per second per meter. Using all the methods that we use to figure out what that threshold is, we don't have time here to go into all that detail, but it was described in the reports on the city's website. The middle picture is a video that was captured by CBC News of a bicyclist along the second beach seawall. And when the waves went down on the right-hand side, you can see some of the damage that started. And that's consistent with the start of light damage. There's a storm uh, some years ago in Seashell and the waterfront there. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a plume of spray coming up. There's a seawall there. You can see the cars on the road. That's on the top of a small, almost, it's, it's not an official dike, but it's, a, it's acting as a dike. You can see the water flowing over that car. It's dangerous to drive on there. There was There's a video. You can find this video online. Uh, and you'll see a pedestrian hiding behind those trees. So it's a, that's what 100 liters per meter per second looks like. If we go to Eagle Crest again, where the waves, the shoreline is more exposed, and we look at one of the existing rock revetments, over the 20 years of data, you can see the number of times when some of those very low thresholds occur. The lowest is you know, once every two years or so. Uh, and only if we were to get uh, combinations of a severe storm and a large high tide would some of those more severe ones be expected or could occur. If we raise everything by a meter, if you remember those energy plots I showed you earlier, you see how that evolves. And so the, uh, the um, low levels of overtopping are now starting to occur every week in the winter. And if we go down to 50 liters per meter per second, where you're certainly starting to be uh, experiencing damage to buildings that are close to the shoreline, like a lot of the residential properties, then on average, you're going to see that once every five to two, which is a substantial increase. Uh, it's still possible to get extreme flooding, but you need a severe storm happening at large tide, which can, of course, occur. So. You know, here in these implications, basically, we're finding that uh, we're realizing that before um, we actually get one meter of sea level rise, there's going to be a slow increase in the recurring damage to existing structures or occasions of minor flooding. They're going to become more frequent. And then finally, when we do actually see a meter of sea level rise, there's a very high risk of um, severe flooding or damage along the shoreline, and especially where most private properties are located. The, the risks, the dangers are not severe, as severe in the town waterfront. So if we zoom out and look at the, what areas are affected by a meter of sea level rise, high tide and storm surge in the Qualicum Beach waterfront, you can see the red areas. That's where flooding would be occurring. That's where these hazards would be occurring. And there's several zones, um, the east and the west wings, where the residential properties are. There's a, definitely a risk of flood damage there. The mainly public area of the waterfront, um, is another area. It's quite narrow, and this is an area where there's two 
town, uh, particular large lots in particular that are that are in danger. So the usual quartet of adaptation options that we see, um, and we're not going to go into all of these and what the city is planning. That's part of phase two. But uh, we talk about raising seawalls and revetments or restoring or augmenting the beach in front of the town waterfront. Um, those are, depending on how you view them, a protect or an accommodate option. So it depends on your view and, and what those could look like. Are sort of illustrated here by these graphics. This is the water level expected in the future. The contours here, the shoreline here, is from the lidar mapping, so it's reasonably accurate. And the tides, the water level here reflects high tide and storm surge. And we're not showing the waves on it, but you can see that the road, the highway, which exists along the town waterfront in the upper view, would be flooded. It probably, it certainly would be dangerous to drive if there was no protection. And the view on the, the lower view shows the Eagle Crest area where the houses are going to be flooded. So we looked at various options. Those, those are the options that we talked about earlier in terms of modeling what their impact was. The hard shoreline option of right seawall and the dashed line to the top of the seawall just reflect what safety standard you would put for people who might be walking behind it. The lower one is a soft shoreline option. This is, happens to be gravel. And again, the dashed lines are different options for defining how high it should be depending on what people are going to do on that seawall. And those could start to look like these. These are almost not quite official pilot projects, but they are projects that have been built along this section of shoreline. That the first, the top one is a view of a gravel beach fill that was put in place a couple of years ago. Seems to be performing very adequately, as would be expected from the modeling results, showing that this sort of the size of material very stable. Uh, the lower one is a the system that that resident living in that house. That's one of those two properties that we identified at the headland uh, shows a gravel and, and beach headland system. Uh, at Eagle Crest, the Eagle Crest area where the private properties are uh, built, the concepts that we just looked at right now, and they're very, very conceptual just to get a handle on how those would affect the coastal processes. So basically extending their coastal structures, which you can see right down there in the, on the right-hand side below the water, uh, up higher, raising them up as a seawall, as a dike, as a sort of an implied impermeable section within it. Um, so those are the options. Now, just modifying the guideline that we're starting to realize is a little bit stale, the, the gray and the red line from the BC planning curve. Yeah, I think uh, we don't have time today to talk about it, but there's a lot of folks are the, the latest report from IPCC, depending on how they handle ice sheet melting, is showing an increase in the rate of sea level rise. And there's a group which I call the Paleo Climate Pessimists, which is Jim Hansen and his 16, 17 very noteworthy co-authors have put forward a very serious uh, hypothesis that we might see five meters of erosion of sea level rise in a century. Um, if we take that sort of guidance, we realize we've got to do things uh, a little bit faster than we've been planning. The risks are perhaps a little bit higher. We've got a few years to go, I think, before we know which of this sort of non-linear curve at the, on the left hand on the right hand side, or the non-linear curves, and which one of those might actually materialize. But uh, these are factors that we're thinking about. And if the pessimists are right, then for the town of Qualicum Beach, it's actually not as serious as you might think. You can see that the the, uh, the areas to the east, to the right on the right-hand side, and on the left where the, a lot of the residents' private properties are, are not particularly uh, flooded. Or we don't get more houses being flooded out. That's because there's a cliff running quite close to the shoreline. The town waterfront area, there's a bit of encroachment up one of the creeks that we actually mentioned about. Um, and uh, of course, there'll, there'll be a lot more water there. So just to kind of wrap up and move into Luke's time here. I don't want to take up uh, too much of it. Uh, this is a timeline looking forward. We're at the end of phase one of the process. He's about to start phase two. And depending on whose sea level rise curve we're, we believe, the, the right hand, the left hand side of these curves are the paleoclimate pessimists. And the, or the right hand side is the uh, present planning curve. You know, these wilder levels are going to come uh, sooner or later. They're going to come eventually. And uh, as we tried to show earlier on with the implications of all that wave energy arriving at the shoreline, we've got a time which still needs to be defined where we're slowly going to move from kind of exciting or interesting effects going on in the waterfront to a time when suddenly they're a nuisance. You know, the town's going to get tired of repairing stuff. People are going to get tired of replacing their seawall. And it's all going to become intolerable. And 
we don't know yet when exactly that's going to happen, but it's sometime in the next 10 to 20 years. And so the timelines are getting to be um, pretty tight for um, people to start thinking and asking, um, what do we, when do we do uh, what to my beach? Because the beach is an important asset for Colica Beach. So Luke's going to take over now. Okay, well thank you John and hello everyone again. So I'd imagine many of you out there are left pondering what to do in the future now that we've heard from John. We know there's very challenging issues ahead and and clearly a lot of those decisions are going to be very, very controversial um, with intense scrutiny from lots of different stakeholders and residents throughout the town. So how do we go about a process that evaluates all these alternatives in a way that's impartial through a decision-making process that's transparent and defensible over time. We, we covered a bit of the context already. So once again, rewinding the clock to 2011 when we did the official community plan review, we had proposals for waterfront walkways, piers, casinos, you name it. And, and at that time, we postponed all consideration of those types of specific proposals until we had done the baseline analysis to understand what our conditions were. Because we want to undertake comprehensive planning that's based on defensible data and research so that the relevancy of these plans will not be undermined by changing or misunderstood coastal conditions. We know that there's many different options as we move forward. Commonly described as the, the four options that John had. Um, here on this is a visualization from the, the city of Delta done by a group at UBC. One of their options was doing nothing. That's where the, the house is flooded there in the upper left. So the big question facing Qualicum Beach, facing many coastal communities, is taking into account the reality that sea levels will continue to rise for generations to come. How can Qualicum Beach maintain and enhance its waterfront for residents, visitors, and marine ecosystems? And of course, that that just you know, a whole multitude of other questions. You know, it continues to unfold. I mean, how do how do we handle private property? Should the town, should municipalities be investing in protection of infrastructure in front of private property? What should we be investing in public property? Which assets are important? You know, what to what extent should we be protecting ecosystems from essentially large scale natural changes in, in the climate? Like th these are not simple questions. So these types of challenging decisions ahead incorporate level of risk. There's long term uncertainty, as John highlighted, we could see a meter of sea level rise in twenty one hundred. If the pessimists are right, it could be 20 years from now. There's a lot of uncertainty, but clearly the issues are serious with a high level of risk. The trade-offs to be discussed are likely to be controversial. You, know, you, you have situations that are good from, say, the perspective of ecosystem preservation, but may be extremely costly or um, have other negative implications. You have concepts that, that might makes sense from a financial perspective, but at a huge social or environmental cost. So the, the financial consequences are potentially very high. The implementation for this project will need to be carried out through the centuries. This is a, a generational problem. This isn't something that solved now, and certainly not with the term of any state official, probably um, staff member. Like it's you know, it's a very long term project. We're essentially setting a foundation for future generations to to improve and project forward. It incorporates solutions that are both permanent and temporary. What might be a reasonable option now, twenty years from now, fifty years from now, may not even be on the table for discussion when you look ahead to twenty one hundred. So 
when dealing with a complex and controversial decision like this, the, the decision-making process you go through is very important. So we've, we've done a lot of research into the kind of rigorous decision-making methodologies that are required so that when we end up with a plan, that it's not undermined by criticisms of the process. So that involves clearly defining the problem, understanding the values of the people and organizations affected, setting clear goals and evaluative criteria, developing a wide range of creative alternatives, evaluating those alternatives according to the evaluative criteria you develop earlier in the process, and then following through with explicit and transparent choices. And of course, at the end of, of this, um, no, no process is complete in its final form to be enshrined forever. Of course, you need to repeat the process. Just, just for everyone's knowledge and benefit, the, this overall approach in many ways is based on a, a decision-making framework called structured decision-making. And it's, it's one that's currently been used in a lot of environmental assessment projects and, and is actually incorporated to a large extent in the International Plant Panel for Clim on Climate Change they're using a, a very similar methodology. So if, if you're interested, I would highly recommend that you look at their website and read some of their material. So the image that I'm showing on the screen right now is the, the specific steps that we're proposing for Qualicum Beach, setting the scope, telling the story, agreeing on values, uh, alternatives, drafting the plan, making the decision. I'll just go through these quickly. I, I see that we're heading quickly towards the end of our session, so I do want to allow time for questions. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these, but the first step of, of any significant project is clearly defining the scope. We know that there's going to be elements that people want to see addressed that are simply not feasible to address within a reasonable period of time or within a reasonable budget. So we have to draw hard lines that say this is in and these things are out. So those hard lines that we're drawing are around the issues, the depth of focus, and to a lesser extent around the stakeholders. So through previous consultations, we have identified a list of issues that, that come up time and time again with regard to the waterfront. And they're sort of jumbled around in this graphic here, but the, the point is that we do have a list of issues that we know need to be addressed through this process. If things come up outside of the scope, we'll discuss them, but it, they're not going to be brought forward straight to the agenda as a part of the process. We, we know that with a limited amount of time and resources, we can't do an exhaustive study and master land use plan for every kilometer of the shoreline, so we have focused on our central waterfront. For those of you who aren't familiar with our waterfront, this is the area where we have large stretches of publicly owned parkland. We do have residents that live there and businesses, but this is the area of the town with the heaviest public investment in infrastructure and with the, the highest intensity of um, values for many of our community members. So in this area, we'll be developing the most detail. So conceptual land use plans, a staged response, capital planning strategy and policies. Outside of that central waterfront area, we'll be focusing more on guidelines and policies. So it, it, the level of detail is simply not going to be quite as much in the outline areas, although we certainly will cover them at a high level. I'm going to just zip right past a lot of this stuff, but, but it, I do want to highlight of these next few steps because it's very important. So to make decisions based on good evaluative criteria, you first need to dive into what the community values. And we do that through a, a storytelling framework. So we, we get the stories through a number of creative engagement techniques. From those stories, we, dis we distill those into values. Community values could be, you know, celebration, family, um, ecology, history, business. There's there's a number of stories that, that intersect and interchange on the waterfront. So from those stories, 
we extract values, we agree on those values. From those values, we can develop evaluative criteria. And then with those criteria, of course, it becomes much easier to evaluate and assess those ideas that we postponed during the last efficiency plan review. We can cast the, wet, the net wide and, and look at a wide, ran wide range of alternatives. From there, the process flows smoothly into drafting the plan and making the decision. And of course, modern monitoring and reviewing that we don't have an expectation that this plan will be perfect the first time. And we also don't have an expectation that uh, it won't need to be updated for in the future because of changing conditions. So we're building into the plan ongoing monitoring and review, maybe on a, a five-year period or perhaps in line with our official community plan reviews every six years. We're using a wide range of public engagement tools that allow you to engage casually on a short-term basis or to engage in a more in-depth manner. And a wide range of stakeholder groups. There are particular groups that we're going to be making extra effort to engage through the process because they're typically underrepresented in our, in our planning processes. First Nations, working age adults, youth, young families, not-for-profits, community groups, business associations. I could be that many of you out there are looking at this list and saying, yeah, they, they're underrepresented in a lot of planning processes. So in, in designing our engagement technique, techniques, we're keeping these groups in mind and making sure that we have options available to them to engage in the manner in, in which they're comfortable and that they can provide the most meaningful input. That concludes my presentation. And I've just added one slide at the end with some links to some resource materials if you're interested in learning more about the process or the uh, methodology behind our, our decision-making framework. There's also a link here to a group at UBC that does some pretty amazing visualization work around climate change and sea level rise. That concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you so much, um, Luke and John, for your wonderful and informative presentations. Uh, we have about 10 minutes now for our Q&A session. So I just want to put it out for our participants. Um, if they can type in their questions in our um, question box in the panel, or if you're interested in speaking verbally, um, you can also let us know and we can unmute you individually. Um, so at this moment, um, I think people are still taking a few minutes to think of questions. So maybe I'll just um, put one question out there for you, Luke. Uh, in your, when you were describing the planning process, you had that slide on all the different issues that came up from community members, and I'm interested to hear about, you know, what were the the big priorities out of those uh, that selection of issues? Okay, well the the highest priority items, I I would say they vary according to the stakeholder group. Of course, for people who own waterfront property, their their highest protect priority would likely be um, identifying reasonable options for them to protect what they have. Uh, other stakeholder groups are very concerned about what sea level rise will do to the ecosystems on the waterfront. You know, we have a very rich ecosystem when it comes down to it, but it depends on a stable climate. And as water levels rise, those that, that baseline is shifting. So uh, in, uh, highest priorities overall, I would say, would be protection of infrastructure, houses, businesses, so on and so forth. And um, you know what the town might do in the future when, when properties are suddenly no longer buildable because of frequent or perhaps permanent flooding. Thanks, Luke. Uh, so we have a question here from Courtney Simpson about what did you hear from the community at the meeting last night? Okay, hi Courtney. 
Um, there were a number of comments um, commending the town for taking this on, but also recognizing how challenging this process will be. Um, we, uh, we and everyone in the meeting was astounded by a lot of the material that John Reedshaw presented and and left with their eyes wide open. So a few speakers spoke about the, the challenge of, of getting community agreement around these types of these decision making values and evaluative criteria. So no one expects this to be easy, um, but it was it was pretty amazing to see the the um, the depth of understanding of a lot of people there in the room. All right, thank you. Um, and we have another question from Jessica Shoebridge about whether any of the phase one coastal modeling took into account changing ocean temperatures. No, we kept the water temperature and all of the hydrodynamic components of the models the same. Uh, that's a good point. Um, we certainly discussed that a lot on the environmental side, which we haven't even talked about here. Um, uh, what, how that will change the uh, marine environment. But in terms of how that might affect, say, the movement of sediment, I think that, um, quite frankly, it's probably a fairly small trend, but um, we're thinking about the future for sure. Thank you, Sean. Um, so we still have the time for a few more questions, and I think people are still thinking about them. So as people are reflecting on that, I'm just going to launch this poll on which adaptation topics uh, you are interested in hearing more about, and we can use this for our future webinar planning. All right. Well, thank you for participating. It seems, well, makes sense for this webinar. There's a lot of interest from our audience on coastal management and sea level rise, as well as infrastructure adaptation and ecosystem protection. So thank you for participating in that. Um, so we'll move on to the next question from Tim Pritchard, uh, who says, I understand that the primary study period was in February 2014, which proved to be a relatively calm winter period. Did this impact the maximum storm impacts that might be experienced in the future and the level of confidence of the results? Um, yeah, the, the study actually extended yeah, primarily through 2014 and, and a good part of 2015 because of the complexity of a lot of the issues that were uncovered. Um, but we're using uh, the storm, the history of the storms uh, that we developed for the last 20 years as the proxy for the future uh, changes. And so within those 20 years of data we're starting, we, we always looked at representative storms um, that were not severe, but we also looked, when, especially when we were thinking about or looking at how the coastal process has changed, other combinations of a severe storm at a low tide or you know, a less severe storm at a higher tide, just so we had a good blend of, of all of the processes. Um, couldn't go into it in the detail. It's, a lot of it's discussed in the reports, but um, it's reasonably independent of that. You can you know, kind of add the um, effects of different combinations together in a fairly linear fashion. Okay, thank you, John. Um, we have a question from Stuart Cohen about how do you foresee the process of ensuring information flow in the long term? Well, well that's an interesting one. Okay, so information flow. Um, the, the biggest challenge that I'd see going on into the future is, is making sure that all the, the information stays current, right? You know, we have a, a fairly massive investment in, 
engineering work that is current right now. Um, it's based on storm data from the last 20 years, but there, the behavior of storms in the future is in, in expected to intensify. You know, so so if the nature of those storms changes in some fundamental way, we'll be challenged to make sure that this this study is updated. So um, information flow, you know, from from the science community to the town is one one a way I could sort of address that question. Of course, there's a, a second step to information flow, and that's that from the town the staff to the public and so and beyond. Okay. Good. Continuing communication to make sure that's that they have the right information to continue making um, informed decisions. Oh, thank you, Liz. Uh, so I'm just going to jump uh, to your question from Trevor Wicks. Uh, how would a tsunami or earthquake affect the planning process? Um, it's John here. Uh, the tsunami and the and the earthquake sort of scenarios are are in a in a sense independent of of the sea level rise issues. They they can always occur. There is a finite probability of some of those things occurring. I think in terms of the planning process, that's always a factor in the planning minds. But um, we're certainly not combining them here. We have to recognize that it could happen. Either one of those could happen at any time. And that certainly would be a moment to revisit and review and redistribute the findings and the implications to the public. It, uh, it's an ongoing process, as, as Luke said earlier. It's um, always in the back of our mind. Mm -hmm. So I know we're getting close to the end of our webinar time, but I have two last questions here that I want to um, speak on. So another one from Courtney Simpson on how much time do you have planned between now and the development of the plan? Thanks, Courtney. So th that th the timing on this project is, is fairly aggressive. We are hoping to have the, um, the first report available in July of this year. We have a, do have a grant reporting deadline shortly after that. So the, the, the key point here, though, is that this whole plan development process is iterative. So we will have a plan in, in July. If for some reason council and the public doesn't feel that's the final version, there's nothing wrong with, with cycling through that process again. You know, going back to values, developing, you know, refining evaluative criteria and and doing another iteration. So the quick answer is seven months. The the longer answer would be as long as it takes. If we we could and um, likely will have to cycle through it in the future, whether it's at the end of that seven month period immediately or in five, ten years. Thanks, Luke. Um, so I think we have time for just one last question and I'll move to a new speaker, um, Harriet, to, and this question is directed to John Reedshaw. Um, does the model you use allow you to show or map relocation of natural boundary or high water mark with sea level rise? Uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, I think it, it does. Um, we, we did uh, start off looking, as I, I um, mentioned earlier, that uh, we looked at the undeveloped shoreline. Uh, that was as the 1908 photograph showed of the uh, of Qualicum Beach before anybody really did much here. Um, it was a fairly simple uh, profile, that extensive low tide bar, the, the gravel beach. Um, now, at that stage and for that particular example, we used uh, a, a somewhat coarser grid resolution. So it was actually sort of 10 meters by 10 meters in that region when we had to put the seawalls in. Uh, later on, we got a much more intensive grid. Uh, it was almost a two meter by two meter resolution, so we could capture all of the important details. Uh, the grid resolution getting down into the weeds here a little bit, uh, it considerably extends the amount of time it takes. Some of those storm simulations, which were looking at two or three storms, actually took about three weeks of pure computing time to execute. Now, 
we could, in theory, if the shoreline eroded, uh, you know, within the grid resolution or beyond the grid resolution. So if it was to erode more than two meters, we could see that. Um, the unstated implication there, of course, is it would take a very, very long time to run those models. Enough storms, since we were in an area of balanced kind of equilibrium, to get shoreline erosion that was greater than the grid resolution. So theoretically, yes, it can. Practically speaking, um, well, there's more and more powerful computers every day. We substantially increased our own computing power just to get this work done in, in the right amount of time as we went through the various iterations. So um, we'd uh, be delighted to talk to you, Harry, about doing that for you. If, uh, <laughs> that's a need, a serious need, but it would be a challenge, I think, to be frank. All right, well, thank you. And um, so unfortunately, we've now run out of time. And I know there's a few more questions, but what we can do is follow up with those participants afterwards to make sure that your questions are answered. Um, so I'd like to say a huge thank you to Luke and John for um, participating as our speakers today and sharing their knowledge and experience around the Qualicum Waterfront Plan. Uh, we're really happy to have you. Um, and also thank you to everyone for um, who spent the time to participate.